What if I told you that there is a way to reverse the aging process and potentially extend our lives by decades? Sound too good to be true? So we made a little bit of a history. Generative AI is going to transform our life uh, beyond recognition in every way. I think that we can at least improve the probability of success by 50%. And that's more, more important than time and cost. So in two years, uh, well, two and a half years, 11 preclinical candidates, it's a pretty cool number. So that is how long it took us to get to preclinical candidate stage uh, with our antifibrotic. Uh, and again, this is the traditional approach. This is our mm. approach. So under 18 months, uh, the ability to very rapidly predict success or failure and also interpret, I think that's uh, that's key. Well, today's guest, Alex Zavaronkov, CEO of Insilicon Medicine, is on a mission to make this a reality. With the help of artificial intelligence, his team is working to uncover the secrets of aging and create drugs that could not only extend our lifespans, but also prevent age-related diseases like Alzheimer's or cancer. In this podcast, you learn about the incredible potential of artificial intelligence in aging research and how in silicon medicine is leading the way. Alex explains the potential to reduce drug development costs, increase the probability of success of drug discovery, and even create drugs for diseases we once thought were untreatable. Get ready to have your mind blown by the groundbreaking research and insights shared in this episode. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us on this journey to revolutionize the way we age. You are live directly from the world's government, government summit. Did I get it right? That's correct. So uh, I'm dialing in uh, from the World Government Summit. I apologize for any background noise uh, because I had to step out of the meeting. Uh, and here it's uh, there, there are no meeting spaces. Um, uh, so very happy to connect. Uh, my name is Alex Shavarankov. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Insilica Medicine. Uh, which is a, a global company, so that's why that's why I am in the Middle East right now. Uh, one mm -hmm. of our sites is in Abu Dhabi, that's cool. and uh, which is a fantastic place to set up. Uh, and uh, right now, I'm presenting from Dubai. What is the World Government Summit all about? Uh, it's all about uh, bringing together uh, world leaders from all around the world to um, ensure that they can achieve common goals. Uh, they also invite uh, business people and scientists to ensure that uh, uh, they have the support from the uh, private and public uh, uh, sector uh, for all kinds of um, uh, discussions about the environment, healthcare, and other um, areas where global collaboration is extremely important. Mm. So it's uh, practically similar to the World Economic Forum. Uh, it's, uh, that's just, that's correct. Uh, it's the it, Middle East version of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's the same thought. It's it's a good thing to have that we are part of the summit now with this uh, podcast. So it's uh, thanks for for coming online, <laughs> Alex. I read in your uh, in your bio that starts directly jump right into it and into what you're doing with in silico research. Uh, I found a lot of uh, articles on the internet where you describe that you come from longevity research. I think we have that in common. I did uh, something similar, not in the academic field, more in the field of martial arts, because the most important question I had was in the, it was back in the 90s. Uh, how can I avoid to get sick? And since in the 90s in Austria, there was not many people really interested in this topic. I switched more to martial arts to find how I can improve my life. And now it's called to think longevity research. Uh, what did you do in this field? So I am uh, participating in this field more from the academic perspective mm -hmm. uh, rather than for from the perspective of self-improvement. Uh, I think that longevity in general is probably the most impactful field anybody can be focused on, right? Because uh, I, if you figure out a way to extend the life of uh, people just by one year for mm -hmm. everybody on the planet, you generate 8 billion life years, right? So that's more than any surgeon or a doctor can uh, um, achieve in their lifetime. 
So I am focused on the discovery of novel therapeutics uh, that may address certain hallmarks of aging. So we look at both. Uh, um, uh, we look at both uh, protein target discovery. So identifying the uh, various uh, possible protein switches that might be important in uh, uh, aging and longevity. Uh, and then we also have uh, a way to design um, novel therapeutics, novel small molecule drugs that go after those targets. Uh, so we have uh, kind of two hands. One uh, searches for promising areas to intervene in, and another hand which uh, allows you to very rapidly generate uh, chemical matter um, uh, that can be turned into a drug. Uh, and for that, I study um, and, and, and I uh, contribute to research in artificial intelligence mm -hmm. that uh, works both in biology and chemistry. Uh, we have a platform called Pharma AI at Encilico that helps accelerate mm -hmm. uh, 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 drug discovery R&D. But many of the programs that we go after are in age-associated diseases and longevity. Mm -hmm. uh, we also contributed quite uh, a bit to the uh, development of a variety of what is, co what is called aging clocks. Um, the uh, biomarkers of aging utilizing artificial intelligence. So you can actually train train deep neural networks uh, um, or, or other uh, AI models uh, that allow you to predict chronological age in a healthy state of the mm -hmm. patient, let's call it uh, biological age, or you could uh, predict uh, um, uh, subjective age, so how old do you feel, <laughs> uh, or even uh, some other features uh, like, for example, perceived age, uh, how uh, old do other people think you are? Right, if you are talking about uh, imaging biomarkers mm -hmm. or psychological biomarkers, so we can look at many, many different data types to build those comprehensive age predictors, uh, and later we can um, design certain interventions for uh, biomarkers that could yield valuable targets, either protein targets or even sometimes non-biological targets. Um, so looking at both, again, interventions uh, and um, uh, diagnostic applications. That's a great thing. Um, I found your company when I was doing uh, some research on LinkedIn about another topic, ChatGPT, and then I came across an article that uh, Regina Hoditz uh, liked where you basically compare your solution in drug development and drug discovery to chat GPT and DALI from OpenAI. Uh, and the thoughts that I had in my mind was, so now that I know how to work with chat GPT and it can produce articles and questions and stuff like that, uh, is it really possible to have an artificial intelligence where you just enter the questions, I want to cure cancer, and the artificial intelligence <sighs> then spits out the drug and the target and everything is solved? What is the state of the art in uh, generative artificial well, intelligence in your field? So sure. Well, again, generative AI as a term has been around for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the term generative artificial networks, um, uh, generative cell networks, sorry, was uh, Gans uh, was coined by Ian Goodfellow in 2014. Uh, in a very famous paper that he co-authored with Yoshua Benjo, probably the highest cited uh, researcher in um, uh, AI. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, uh, in that paper, they've described uh, how to utilize generative adversarial networks to uh, imagine handwriting written ca characters, for example. Since then, in just a year, the technology has progressed to the level where you could generate pictures uh, that are of very high quality, where we can describe uh, um, what you want to see, and Gan will create it for you. Uh, that was the year when we got into uh, generative adversarial networks as well with molecules. So just like with a picture or uh, with a handwritten character, you can uh, describe the molecule you want, and the Gan will generate it for you with the desired properties mm -hmm. using multi-parameter optimization techniques. Uh, and uh, then since, since since 2016, this technology has progressed uh, pretty dramatically, right? So in 2020, you could generate pictures of people that are indistinguishable from photographs, right? Or almost indistinguishable. 
Uh, and uh, nowadays, uh, with these tools like DALI and Midjourney, uh, generative technologies uh, now also transform neural networks uh, and other forms of generative AI uh, became consumerized. So now consumers got access to those tools that we were using professionally for quite a, quite a while. Uh, and they have propagated uh, into many industries. Uh, so Midjourney and DALI, for example, are now used to generate very valuable uh, images uh, from a single prompt. Uh, ChatGPT is now outperforming humans in some of the writing tasks, mm -hmm. especially when language is not your first language. Uh, but in um, our field, in drug discovery, this technology has progressed quite a bit. So we uh, synthesized and tested our first AI-generated molecule in 2017. That led to some considerable investment, but also uh, established us as a player in this field. Uh, so there we uh, designed small molecules against a specific target. So you basically take a protein crystal structure and tell your AI to design molecules that would be very selective mm. uh, and active against that specific protein target uh, and also could be drug-like. So something that is not a poison and uh, can get into the, um, uh, into the body uh, via uh, oral administration, so not injectable, for example. Uh, and we've uh, synthesized a number of those molecules, tested some, uh, and uh, published our first paper in 2018, submitted 2017. Uh, and then in 2019, we demonstrated a race where uh, another company challenged us to design small molecules against a very well-known target in fibrosis. Mm -hmm. uh, and we very rapidly generated small molecules, tested them uh, against the target, uh, and demonstrated that the generation conditions were confirmed using experiments. Uh, so that's 2019. And then we productized it. So we developed software around it with many, many, many different generative models uh, for chemistry and for biology and released it to the pharmaceutical companies. And now 10 out of the top 20 pharmaceutical companies have used our tools in one way or another. So it's actually pretty widespread uh, in drug discovery. In longevity, uh, generative techniques, uh, we used them for the first time in 2017, where we used age as a generation condition. So that's where you can um, uh, generate very high quality synthetic biological data for a person that you that does not exist, right? So for example, mm -hmm. you can take yourself as a template, say, okay, well, I'm Christian, uh, here is my gene expression profile, and I want to see how this gene expression profile looks like in 20 years. So you say, okay, well, generate uh, according to this gene expression, uh, 1,000 versions of Christian uh, skin, for example, um, uh, and show me different ages, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, from, let's say, you know, 40 to 50. And uh, the system will generate a bunch of those gene expression profiles. Um, you as a human would not be able to interpret it, but you would be able to uh, trick pretty much every AI system that is trained to predict age using gene expression, right? Um, and this approach allows you to also identify valuable uh, targets, valuable genes uh, that makes your gene expression profile younger or older, right? So mm -hmm. just by basically um, uh, moving this dial, uh, which is age, back and forth on several biological data types, we can actually get valuable insights into what's making you older or younger and also try to find causal relationships. So um, I think that generative AI will also help quite a bit study aging. We found some targets this way already. Uh, and um, we currently have the first drug that we've designed uh, using generative AI for a novel target uh, already in human clinical trials. Uh, so we just uh, got the top line data from the phase one clinical study where we, where we test safety. Now we're going into phase two for a very broad indication with no cure. Um, 
but the way we found this target was also using aging research. So I think generative AI in uh, uh, biomedicine is very well established and very broadly used. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. I had a um, couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation with Jack Scannell. He coined the term Eroom's Law uh, in 2010. And we were talking about the big problems that we have in drug discovery and drug development. And uh, I would like to hear your opinion on what generative AI and artificial intelligence can do. Uh, I mean, the basic principle, you also said in some interviews that 90% of drug candidates fail in clinics. And when we look from uh, coming from the lab bench, we are probably about 99% failure rate. And amazingly, the expenses for one drug in the last 10 years went up from roughly $1 billion per drug. Uh, to three to four billion dollars. Uh, how do you see that artificial intelligence, or how can artificial intelligence help to solve these problems to make uh, drug development faster, more accurate, and uh, also cut back the costs? Where is uh, what is the role of generative AI in this field? So sure, thank you for asking this question uh, because I would be able to answer first in numbers, right, with real facts. Mm -hmm and then give you a little bit more of a futuristic view. Super. So as you know, our company, uh, we raised uh, just over 400 million, but mostly uh, it was in the last two years. Uh, so from uh, mostly biotechnology investors who understand biotech. Uh, and um, last year, just in 2022, we nominated nine preclinical candidates. So eight internal and one for, for an external collaborator. Uh, and in small molecules, that's a very large number. Usually a big pharmaceutical company would nominate uh, you know, four, five, six. Uh, sometimes when they're lucky, they can go. I don't know a big pharma company uh, that nominated 10, for example, in a single year. Um, it would be uh, you, you, usually they have a lot of programs, but many of them are external. And many of them are in biologics. So in small molecules, uh, you usually don't have this space of R&D. Uh, usually to get to this point, to a point of preclinical candidate, you would, uh, with all the failures, you would probably spend, uh, uh, well, is a biotech probably around $100 million, right? If you are going after new targets. Uh, and uh, in pharma, it's going to be even more expensive because they, they, they usually waste a lot of time and effort on uh, uh, all kinds of bureau bureaucratic things, right? And just people do not focus and work as hard and fast as in biotechnology companies. So this improvement in ex uh, and, and acceleration in uh, uh, drug discovery is real. So it's not just blah, blah, futuristic, right? So nine preclinical candidates in a single year, it's, we would demonstrated that. In 2021, we nominated only two preclinical candidates. Um, and this year, we expect to, uh, you know, hopefully exceed our internal record. Uh, and some of these uh, drugs went into clinic. So usually by this time, the failure rate is very high. Uh, and again, we raised only 400 and we managed to... Um, uh, get to preclinical candidate stage with now since uh, we started doing our own discovery, um, we managed to uh, progress 11. Uh, it's a pretty big number. And uh, you can compare drug discovery to space exploration, right? So first you need to launch your first, uh, um, uh, first rocket, right? Reach the orbit uh, and or, you know, suborbital flights. Uh, but still with some payload delivery. Uh, and the most difficult one is your first, right? Or your second. But then when you demonstrate that it consistently works, uh, you can do much more and also people start believing in it. So I think generative AI already transformed drug discovery and we have contributed significantly to this process because we also, in addition to uh, using generative AI internally, we also gave it to other people in the form of software. So now a lot of people are using our software uh, for target discovery. It's so easy to use that high school students can use it, and they do. Uh, for small molecule generation, uh, it is not as easy to use, 
uh, and we only deploy it within big pharma companies. And but they, those that understand the value, instead of you know trying to say, oh, we are we we, we can do a better job. Uh, by the way, if some 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 of them say that, they can also implement some of their models in our software, so it's so flexible. Uh, but many of them are afraid of doing that because then um, if you don't outperform, well, you would have to rely on our software. Uh, uh, usually it's a good good idea to do both. Uh, and um, I think that the cost component and the time component is not as important as the probability of success component, right? Because when you are using generative AI for both target discovery and small molecule chemistry, I think that you can uh, significantly improve the probability of success because very often you would go after maybe not so hard targets, but when you have a choice of a target uh, and you can very rapidly fast forward, um, you can find those combos uh, that have not been previously explored. Uh, because either people thought that it's a maybe you know uh, not a very competitive target, uh, or it's a very difficult target, or this target might not address uh, a substantial patient population, or it's just too new. So they try to ignore this target because uh, there is very little biology and biological evidence available around this target. And we managed to match make uh, the target with uh, the generated molecule. Uh, in a most efficient way. We we'll also try to forecast into the future and see which targets are going to be hot because many of them are made for sale for big pharma companies, right? So we would not be able to progress many of them um, ourselves into phase three, for example, right? It just, we won't be able to raise so much capital. Uh, and um, when you are trying to do those three steps with generative AI, I think that you are significantly improving the probability of success, even from the strategy perspective, because many of those uh, programs within big pharma companies, they fail because of strategic choice. So they actually just decide to pivot uh, their strategic direction and refocus, for example, from oncology to CNS, uh, or from you know one target discovery philosophy to another. They want to say, okay, we're gonna go only for uh, genomically validated targets. And then, you know, 70% of the pipeline is stopped or, you know, cut, uh, and they just refocus. And a lot of that is uh, uh, wasted due to um, strategic reasons. So when you also try to extrapolate uh, the kind of hotness of the target space into the future and try to see what is going to be valuable for big pharma companies uh, from the strategic perspective, uh, you can also minimize that risk. So I would be uh, guessing right now, but I think that we can at least improve the probability of success by 50%. And that's more, more important than time and cost. And that's at least, right? Because for us internally, pretty much every program we tried uh, has succeeded. So we failed a few times, but more than 90% of the time we succeeded to get to a preclinical candidate and uh, into the clinic. 50% the probability of success from in which stage are we talking about clinical uh, trials or are we uh, already earlier? So it, uh... I'm talking about earlier, much earlier. Mm -hmm. So from really? target discovery stage all the way to, let's say, phase one clinical trials. Um, and the reason I can say that is because currently we have just a few of those programs, mm -hmm. right? And uh, uh, so far, the probability of success was almost 100%, right? So... Um, 50% reduction in probability of success, uh, in probability of failure, is um, uh, my personal conservative estimate. And of course, we did it on a tiny fraction of the cost uh, and in a fraction of the time. So in two years, uh, well, two and a half years, 11 preclinical candidates, it's a pretty cool number. That's um, that's really amazing. So for, for my understanding, um, the numbers that I have in mind are that uh, when we look earlier before preclinics, we have a success rate of 1% and uh, your programs have a success rate of 100%, basically, when I understood you right. So it means that you weed everything out that doesn't work very quickly 
and move only those compounds forward into preclinical development and clinical development that have a real high probability of success already. Is this the right understanding? Yeah, well, that's the that that that's I would say a little bit more ambitious way to explain it. <laughs> Uh, but um, why don't I visualize mm -hmm. uh, and share a screen? I just need to have uh, screen sharing privileges. Um, uh, and I'll just show your um, followers uh, one slide, which is very important. That's a good idea. Um, uh, you got the yeah. rest. So here you go. Um, that is the slide which describes that's from Stephen Paul's mm -hmm. paper, um, uh, formerly at LA Lilly when he published it uh, in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery, very famous journal, uh, which describes uh, uh, these different steps of uh, drug discovery and development. Uh, and in his paper, he described just those steps from target to hit all the way to submission and launch. Um, and showed that it costs about $1.8 billion, right, from target to hit. And here are the probabilities of success on the top. Here is the number of years it took, mm -hmm. uh, it usually takes. And here is, on average, uh, the number of millions of dollars that every step costs. Uh, I added my own estimates to the slide, uh, disease hypothesis and target discovery that's usually performed in academia. Not in big pharmaceutical companies. They very rarely discover good targets that get progressed into um, late stage clinical trials. And here, the probability of success I estimated to be 1% to 5%, predominantly because um, currently the NIH, National Institute of Health, uh, their budget annually is $45 billion, right? So they actually spend quite a bit of money, but there are very few good targets that uh, reach the clinic. And usually it takes one to 10 years, uh, could cost you billions of dollars. For example, Alzheimer's, we still don't know a single good target that mm. would work for everybody, right? Uh, and the disease hypothesis is poorly understood. That's why we have to study aging to understand Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's understanding may help us understand aging a little bit more. Um, so, what we have done so far is we've taken one of our programs uh, from discovery to phase one top line data received, right? So basically we can refer to it uh, as phase uh, one complete. Um, and uh, we've done all this uh, for, for, for this program. We haven't failed yet. <laughs> so fingers crossed. Uh, we did it in um, uh, under three years, right? So usually it would take you um, uh, you know, five and a half, six years, sometimes a decade. Uh, and it would take you a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? So basically close to a billion. Uh, we have done that on a fraction of the cost. So to reach the preclinical candidate uh, stage at that time, um, uh, just for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis application uh, indication, it took us about $3, $3 million. Um, uh, of course, we have tested it for many other indications, right? So we're taking it also for chronic kidney disease, that specific target. Uh, and uh, um, we're doing indication expansions into skin fibrosis as well. It's one fibrotic target. Mm -hmm. um, but just that is a pretty cool number. Uh, and let me see if I can um, show some other interesting slides just to explain uh, this process. Um, and again, I will have to apologize one more time to your uh, listeners for the background noise because I'm at the World Government Summit. Um, so that is how long it took us to get to preclinical candidate stage uh, with our antifibrotic. Uh, and again, this is the traditional approach. This is our mm. approach. So under 18 months, under $3 million for IPF only. Uh, and then um, under 30 months uh, into close to phase one complete when I made this slides, now we're we are here. Um, and again, we did it at a fraction of the cost. To my knowledge, it's the first uh, AI generated drug to reach uh, human clinical trials and uh, uh, go through the phase one clinical trials. Um, so we made a little bit of a history Hopefully, congratulations. Uh, and 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 uh, even if we, you know, do not succeed in phase two, it was uh, a very um, 
cost-effective journey compared to everything else. Uh, but we, of course, are aiming for uh, major success. Mm. Uh, and uh, so this is the first drug where we managed to get uh, all the way to humans. We actually conducted um, a phase zero study. So a small study in a small number of uh, humans, eight humans in Australia, uh, healthy volunteers. We call it phase zero because, again, the target is new, right? So before, and we are a small company. We wanted to ensure that we understand the target uh, and the compound distribution a little bit better. And then we started uh, a phase one trial uh, in 80 healthy volunteers, just about the top line data. Um, and th these are all slides, but we, uh, we have... Um, progressed with our target X. We haven't disclosed it. And we have several other very promising targets, uh, including targets for COVID. So mm -hmm. for C3-like protease, uh, that one is ready to go human right now as well. Uh, and it's a very selective broad spectrum molecule. So it works pretty much in every um, COVID strain that we've uh, tested it against. Um, and we also have a lot of cancer targets uh, that are specifically tailored for um, licensing to big pharmaceutical companies. So we try to have very high quality data packages that would be very attractive to um, uh, to those kind of companies. And just to show you a case study um, uh, that we published openly for everybody, so you can go back and trace our work. Mm -hmm. um, and we try to publish uh, as much of our work as possible uh, open uh, with, with open access. Um, so we went after ALS, which is a very popular disease actually for all AI-powered drug discovery companies, uh, but we try to do it in the open. Um, it's a rare disease, but uh, there are still a lot of patients uh, out there. And very often when I speak with uh, my friends, somebody knows somebody who had ALS or has ALS right now. Um, we decided to, to use all of our uh, software tools, Pandaomics, Chemistry for Intuition, and Twinico that are available uh, commercially right now uh, for target discovery, small molecule chemistry, and prediction of clinical trials outcomes. Um, and utilized Pandaomics, uh, where we utilized massive amount of uh, data uh, available to us from public repositories for ALS and other diseases. Uh, we used multiple uh, AI algorithms and AI models uh, to come up with target hypotheses. Also got some textual evidence that some of those targets may be implicated in ALS. Uh, explored various drug filters uh, for, 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 for uh, exploring target, uh, tar uh, whether the target is good for small molecules or uh, uh, biologics, uh, whether it's commercially viable. And then we partnered with the wonderful key opinion leaders in this field, Mary Chutkovic, uh, head of neurology at, um, uh, at uh, Harvard MGH, mm -hmm. Jeffrey Rostein, uh, head of the Brains uh, Project, uh, and a very prominent neuroscientist, uh, neurobiologist from uh, Hopkins, uh, Bai Lu uh, from Tsinghua University, and Ke Zhang, uh, from Mayo Clinic uh, to work with massive data sets from ANSWER ALS Consortium, uh, where uh, a lot of human um, ALS cells were reprogrammed into baby cells called iPSCs, uh, and uh, genetic profiles were uh, evaluated, uh, and also they were later programmed into full-scale full neurons also with uh, all kinds of molecular data coming from the samples. Um, and also we used a lot of samples from our own uh, uh, databases that are pro properly uh, integrating and annotating massive amounts of public avail available data, uh, ran it through Pandaomics and found new targets and also older targets with drugs to repurpose. And then we tested those drugs very rapidly in a fly model from Mayo Clinic. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to rare diseases, um, and especially the diseases of the brain, there are very few uh, models where you can test your hypotheses, right? So you can test it in mice, you can test it in human neurons, you can try to grow them, uh, or you can uh, use a model organism uh, like uh, flies, for example, and do very quick tests. So we very so you find we can find more information about this project at ALS.ai. Uh, we use this fly model from Mayo uh, and demonstrated that uh, 
in uh, uh, ocul 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 ocular neurons uh, where um, the uh, G4C230 phenotype is observed, very similar to um, many ALS uh, um, phenotypes that are observed in humans. Um, many of the drugs that we predicted, uh, many of the targets worked and rescued the phenotype. So AI can pick the targets and very rapidly demonstrate strong rescue, moderate rescue, and mild rescue. And a few targets, of course, didn't work, right? Um, and we've published it openly. Uh, and some of those uh, drugs, some of those targets, they do have uh, already existing drugs. Uh, and we've published those uh, for repurposing. I know that uh, there, there are some companies that are now trying those drugs and targets clinically. So uh, that's one of the ways to test your hypothesis very quickly. And yeah, then we actually did our own chemistry and uh, I'm gonna pause here because uh, that's gonna be a long story and uh, with a lot of uh, chemistry terms and maybe it's gonna be boring for your readers, for your listeners. Um, but uh, we managed to demonstrate that we can very rapidly with AI identify new targets, uh, uh, and validate those targets either using uh, knockouts uh, mm -hmm. or real chemistry. Uh, and for a very uh, important disease with no cure uh, and then published uh, rapidly, right? So we didn't even um, think about commercializing this uh, when we published. Uh, and for many other diseases, we do something similar, uh, but we do it internally. In the in the first slides, if I remember it right, you said that uh, you cut back the time that you need to bring uh, a drug candidate into the clinics, and uh, instead of any remember it right, it was about four hundred fourteen million in a traditional way that uh, a company needs to move a company in phase uh, a drug candidate into phase one, and with your technology, you did it for three million dollars. Is this uh, did I remember that right? That's correct. Wow. So we managed to get to preclinical candidate stage just for IPF indication yeah, because yeah. Uh, there you need to, to, to claim a preclinical candidate in our world. Uh, you need to demonstrate efficacy in uh, several models, so at least three. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, we used uh, one in vitro model and two mice models so to demonstrate efficacy in uh, uh, for, for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. For so, other types of fibrosis, we, of course, mm -hmm. uh, did many, many other experiments that increased the cost pretty dramatically. Yeah. So, but for uh, proving what artificial intelligence can do in drug development, I think it's a good example because you cut back the costs to 1% or you can uh, do 100 drugs uh, at the same price of one with the traditional way. <laughs> so it's basically, it's a very amazing fee, uh, feat. What was the response from regulator regulatory authorities? when you approach them with uh, your artificial intelligence uh, approach, was it uh, a no-brainer for them to say, okay, it's uh, it's cool, move forward, or did you have some challenges to solve? So, of course, we got some interest from the regulators, mm -hmm. especially in Asia. So, uh, in uh, China, the NNPA was very interested in our uh, results and uh, uh, we're in active discussions. Uh, and uh, in the U.S., uh, we, we, we got some interest, so I actually did uh, give a talk, uh, um, uh, virtual talk at the uh, to, to the FDA, uh, to one of the big departments, uh, and we are trying to establish this connection. Uh, and basically, there our program one, which is uh, um, going to human clinical trials phase two, is going to be the highlight, right? So. That's mm. what we need to focus on right now. Um, and uh, have the tool that we really want the regulators to use, it's called Inclinico, which predicts the outcomes of phase two to phase three transitions and also interprets some of the um, uh, likely failures and successes, right? Uh, so we're trying to uh, um, make this tool available to the regulators as well. Currently, we're selling this to um, uh, hedge funds and banks to the financial industry and also piloting mm -hmm. with them to uh, improve the tool um, because, of course, uh, the industry that gets uh, hurt the most 
uh, by failure is is the other VCs and and hedge funds that are investing in those uh, uh, and banks that are investing in uh, in the companies uh, that are you know running phase two clinical trials. That's where most of the failures are, uh, and they usually either win a lot or or lose a lot, right? So um, uh, the ability to very rapidly um, predict success or failure and also interpret i think that's uh, that's key to uh, the financial industry but also to the regulators because very often clinical tra- uh, phase 2s actually succeed but later they fail in phase 3 because the clinical study was mismanaged somewhere and our tools uh, again hopefully will be able to allow to identify those mismanaged mismanagements yeah do, what do you think in future? Is it possible to completely um, avoid clinical trials to just predict uh, the success with artificial intelligence and not do human trials anymore uh, unless we are in phase three? Or uh, is it uh, just... Uh, no, you from... won't be able to do that. You need to do <laughs> human clinical trials for sure. Yeah. Uh, even uh, with something... So right now, there are pretty much no medicines that work 100%, right? And uh, uh, many of the medicines that are that you think work, they actually work for the wrong reason. So uh, I think that until we figure out how to simulate this entire world at the atomic level and also recreate it with many, many different people, we will require human clinical trials to be conducted. I just hope that the regulatory authorities will become much more aware of Mm -hmm. uh, generative or or the potential of generative AI and actually recent achievements and start paying closer attention to um, what we do, for example, uh, and try to get more involved and try to accelerate, right? So I think that uh, currently, the regulators would play a much more active role at accelerating uh, the pace of technological progress. And very often we should actually think about uh, how to uh, make really rapid pilot runs where you try to set records in certain areas, right? So if I were uh, a position right now uh, focused on um, you know, improving the pharmaceutical uh, industry, I would try to identify a few opportunities, for example, in rare diseases where AI could be used end-to-end. And I would try to partner with a few companies, well, for example, like our ours or mm-hmm. with ours, to try to go from discovery to uh, the clinic in the shortest amount of time possible. So you basically design a strategy. You say, okay, well, this is the disease I want to go after, preferably mm-hmm. with, with a target that is not obvious, uh, for example, like ALS, and uh, then give us green lights to conduct uh, rapid clinical studies with novel small molecules and observe how uh, those studies pan out and also allow us to get the approval as quickly as possible, right? And for example, if you can tangibly demonstrate that you can do this within you know, four years, for example, well, you just cut down the time by you know, 60% and demonst- you can demonstrate that the effective drug can go into uh, humans uh, and I'm talking about to, to, to the or to the market in mm-hmm. in a certain amount of time, and then you can benchmark against that pilot. So you need to have a few of those, uh, you know, going to the moon uh, cases, preferably in a smaller scale for more rare diseases, but with poorly understood biology, um, in the race format, just to get uh, better at uh, um, uh, just to get better at uh, you know regulating for bigger bigger diseases, right? Uh, so I would try to do that. 
And currently, I don't know of any politician or regulatory authority that would be looking at this at scale. Mm. Now, it's interesting. I mean, uh, with, with large scale studies in fields like COVID, for example, uh, 40,000 patients, uh, 40,000 people was easy to find. I was involved in two companies um, who did research in rare diseases and the timelines in clinics were just... Uh, not very attractive to VCs. I mean, when I approach VCs and say, look, we need five to 10 years to recruit enough patients. Um, they are not very happy with that timeline and uh, are reluctant to invest. Where do you see artificial intelligence in, 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 in the field of clinical trial to really speed up? The, I mean, when you don't find the patients, what can you do with that in artificial intelligence? So sure. Well, again, if you go for China, for example, mm -hmm. some of the disease, rare diseases are not so rare. <laughs> so you can do um, uh, faster recruitment. And I actually think that uh, for this kind of exercise uh, in AI, uh, that's one of the areas where international collaboration could help a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. So currently we see a lot of uh, what we call you know, trade wars. Uh, between U.S. and China specifically, uh, and actual real wars, <laughs> uh, where Russia invaded Ukraine, for example. Um, but with the uh, with rare diseases and races for AI powered in AI powered drug discovery, I hope that authorities could collaborate and maybe we could recruit some of those patients uh, mm -hmm. much quicker. Um, and also, I'm pretty sure if the, uh, um, you know, an agency like the FDA would uh, prioritize uh, our field uh, in, a, in a bigger way and specifically, uh, you know, look at how to, um, uh, at how to conduct such, a, such an experiment, right? I'm pretty sure we could come to a conclusion very quickly. It would require just one day of a seminar. Uh, or, or of meetings, workshops to come up with a proper, proper strategy. Um, I'm pretty sure that we can also get some significant financial backing from the private sector, mm. because uh, if um, uh, the, the regulators would demonstrate that at the end, there is some potential uh, profit involved, right? So uh, the VCs who would be funding something like this would have a big payout, plus uh, a seat at the table for future uh, races like that, I'm pretty sure we would be able to do that. But currently, mm -hmm. nobody is um, motivated enough to, uh, uh, to go after those races. Of course, the COVID case was probably the best demonstration of uh, abilities and also draw drawbacks and uh, inefficiencies in the industry. So even the first drug that has been uh, properly approved, uh, Paxlovid, uh, so Pfizer drug, um, it's still a very old molecule that is very rapidly repackaged uh, as an oral um, uh, as an oral C3-like protease inhibitor with another drug together that helps with uh, you know SIP inhibition with better um, stability of the molecule. Uh, so it's definitely an imperfect uh, drug that probably wouldn't go through in a normal environment. Uh, but during COVID, you've seen that they've managed to basically conduct all the clinical work in uh, a year and a half, right? So that is something that the regulators are capable of. Mm. So now let's try and do that with a novel target, novel molecule, right? So why don't we? Uh, try to increase the novelty and do another race, uh, not wait for another pandemic. Yeah, no, the pandemic was amazing. I mean, to see the whole industry move so quickly. We have one question from the audience. I will uh, uh, allow M. Kayesh, I hope uh, I speak the name right, uh, maybe to ask the question himself. Uh, Kayesh, you have the micro. Um, would you like to ask your question? Hi. Uh, I'm really enjoying uh, talking. I am Azam Kayase from Dubai. Uh, oh. thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really, uh, I am proud of you, what you are doing. Uh, this is, I asked you before, but I want to know after I listened to your lecture, 
artificial intelligence microbiome uh, based therapeutic tools. Can we apply what you are talking on the microbiome new molecule? So absolutely. So if you have a very good microbial uh, target, uh, so expressed by bacteria, uh, our AI can perform as well on this target as it does on human targets. As long as you have the crystal or uh, you have a uh, uh, predictive crystal structure from AlphaFold or AzetaFold or some other algorithm, um, we could do similar things on microbial targets. Plus, um, uh, we could look at new target discovery uh, utilizing very similar tools like Panda Omics. And uh, what we did uh, specifically, um, so about 2017, I trained the deep neural network uh, to predict human chronological age in a healthy state using uh, microbiomic uh, data, using whole genome sequencing data um, of human gut microbiome. Uh, and we got to reasonable accuracy for prediction of uh, human age. Again, that's one of the features that is present in pretty much every data set, right? Uh, and we demonstrated which bacteria are more senopositive and senonegative. So contribute to uh, you, quote unquote, looking younger to the deep neural network or quote unquote, looking older uh, to the deep neural network. Uh, and that showed you that uh, deep neural networks can actually zoom into specific uh, bacterial species uh, that may um, perform certain uh, certain roles, play certain roles in uh, different biological processes. So in this case, in aging, um, there, of course, the causality is poorly understood, but we can at least uh, narrow down to specific bi uh, specific microbial species. Um, and again, chemistry is chemistry. So uh, in, in chemistry, we can develop small molecules, uh, discover small molecules for bacterial targets, um, no problem. Uh, for, 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 for disease target research, uh, we can possibly A, narrow down to individual bacterial species. And then within bacterial species, uh, we could identify possible targets just by looking at what uh, um, proteins are important for the various uh, biological processes within bacterial species. So there are many ways to integrate AI uh, in drug discovery using microbiome. Uh, and there are many companies uh, in addition to ours uh, that are actually doing maybe even a better job at target discovery using microbiome. I personally do not prioritize uh, microbiome uh, as a data type uh, within Ancilico because we have many, many other data types to focus on. Um, it's of course promising, uh, but I think again, for from the drug discovery perspective, currently we are prioritizing other data types. So we like to have uh, human proteins as targets. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am looking to work with you or under your umbrella. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Would love to explore any collaborations. Thank you. Talking about collaborations, uh, you mentioned that your company operates in the Middle East, in China, and uh, I also think in the United States and in Canada. Uh, why did you decide to go this way? So we try to go uh, after the best talent in the world. Very often we hire through competitions. Uh, and uh, in Europe, for example, we used to hire through massive national competitions, hackathons. Um, and then, uh, for example, when Russia invaded Ukraine, we realized that much of this valuable talent from Europe could be moved to the Middle East. So I uh, managed to get quite a bit of the quote-unquote AI refugees um, uh, originally into Abu Dhabi. And then we realized that that's a great place to actually uh, host talent, specifically AI talent. And we started hiring and we grew the team uh, to about 40 uh, here. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that's one of the reasons for international expansions, expansion into the Middle East. Uh, China is a very special case. So much of the biomedical research uh, and contract research infrastructure is in China. So they are over the past 20 years, they invested over half a trillion dollars into uh, biomedical infrastructure uh, and research infrastructure. So you don't uh, need to own your own labs. You can actually hire our contract research organizations to do it for you. As an, an for an AI focused company, uh, not the, the the absence of this uh, labs uh, is actually a competitive advantage. So you have to, if you want to move quickly, you can you can actually move very quickly by outsourcing many many different experiments to many different labs. Uh, do it in parallel and also have redundancy, right? So very often one lab may screw it up, another lab may succeed. Which one do you go with, right? So then you repeat the experiments in both. Mm -hmm. Very often if you do it internally and if you succeed um, in places where you should not succeed uh, and you proceed with the, uh, with, with the program, uh, it will be very damaging in later stages. So we try to introduce quite a bit of redundancy when we are talking about uh, um, experimental data. So China is very important. It's a very important place to do experiments. Uh, and uh, if you do have resources there overseeing um, the large number of full-time equivalents within contract research organizations, you can get higher quality and faster speed and even uh, create an ecosystem of those contract research organizations that is very seamless and is better than your than having your own lab. Of course, we do have our own fully robotics uh, mm -hmm. laboratory as well, but uh, relying on those CROs is key. And of course, Montreal, Canada is a great place to hire AI talent. That's the capital of artificial intelligence. One of the capitals, uh, the second one would be Toronto. Um, so still Canada, so proud to be Canadian. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, uh, and uh, Taiwan, for example, great part of China where um, we can hire really amazing computational chemists. Uh, and in Hong Kong, we do have our target discovery group, which um, utilizes a lot of RAI tools to discover new targets. But actually, it's really unusual to have this geographic distribution. But for us, it works and it makes us a much more resilient organization. And I think that this level of diversity helps us innovate uh, at a broader scale. Yeah, and you can uh, make use of uh, the best from all countries. So it's uh, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing the approach that you have. It's, uh, I like it. You mentioned before you have a fully intelligent robotics lab. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So sure, uh, I already tested if I do show you the video uh, via Zoom, it's not going to be of good quality and it's going to lag. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll just talk through it and maybe you can post a link to this lab yeah, could, yeah. Uh, in comments. Uh, so we, we, we realized that now that we have demonstrated that AI can very efficiently identify new targets uh, that actually get validated using real experiments, we can now do it at a higher scale, at a broader scale. Uh, and um, we wanted to automate this process of target discovery. So we're not reliant on this incremental data for uh, target discovery, but we can um, now perform experimental validation of our algorithms much faster. So we have a lab where you can throw in a sample. Imagine that a sample comes from some animal model of disease, uh, of disease, right? So you take uh, a piece of animal tissue. I just don't want to use the human analogy. Um, where you've got, uh, for example, certain cancer of a specific tissue. You throw it into the robot. The robot picks it up, uh, grinds it, microplates it, does quality control analysis, then sends it automatically into another room where part of the sample is being placed in the incubator. Uh, so you grow some of those uh, cells uh, or even primary tissue um, or store it. Uh, and But part of the tissue goes into the um, uh, high-resolution imaging system. So it gets imaged. 
Uh, you also um, incubate uh, uh, some of this tissue with contrast markers. So you get uh, high content uh, imaging with uh, um, fluorescence. So part of the sample gets destroyed. Uh, then it gets sent to another room uh, where you get uh, uh, omics data. So transcriptomics and uh, met met methylation data uh, and several other data types. All this data goes back into AI. AI decides which targets are important in that specific uh, uh, sample uh, and which uh, drugs already work on this target. Mm -hmm. Picks those drugs from the libraries uh, and tests them in a high, 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 high throughput manner. Uh, different incubation times, different concentrations. And then every sample goes through the same exact uh, uh, cycle. So it gets imaged, uh, it gets well high resolution and also uh, fluorescence imaging, and you get uh, um, epigenetic data and you get uh, um, uh, gene expression data and plus other data types. And you, then you compare your predictions to the actual experimental data and see if the, tar if the targets were found and if the compounds work. And in parallel, you also try to uh, uh, find some novel biology. So find some novel biological hypotheses that might be uh, valuable in the future. So this lab is more of a target discovery plus target validation lab. Now we are uh, miniaturizing it. We're trying to make it smaller. So you can even do this at the hospital level. Imagine if you could do personalized drug discovery for individual patients. Well, uh, or perform some uh, already um, established uh, personalized medicine services or um, decision support services for physicians and at the same time discover targets. So you could place those labs in regions that never even aspired to be a player in biotechnology. Um, how, sm how small can you make it? Uh, I think I can do it in two rooms. Two rooms. This is yeah. practically you can can do it everywhere. Then it's not. Yeah, currently it's the entire floor which is automated, mm -hmm. um, and it's a pretty complex system. So it's many rooms uh, performing different tasks uh, with many different types of equipment. I think if I try to place this equipment in three D, and also um, uh, make some of my own equipment. Uh, I would be able to automate this process with just two rooms. So it's possible to run the processes in every hospital of the world, basically with a well, two, every rooms. major one that, <laughs> that can afford something like that. Yeah, or if there is a government program that allows you yeah. to uh, uh, to do something like that. So uh, currently, that's a dream, mm. right? But and, and I, they don't. I cannot guarantee you that we will have a hospital-based robot, but you know, three years ago, I did not even dream about the lab that we have. Yeah, this would be my final part uh, for this conversation. So looking into the future, uh, but before I ask that, uh, we're coming to the end of the podcast. Uh, is there any question open that you would like me to ask? Is there anything that I missed that you think is important to share? Well, I think that you covered pretty much everything. I must say that uh, the most important disease that we have uh, in the world is actually aging mm. because we will all lose function and die. And in this process, we will also get a bunch of diseases and trauma and um, uh, it, it's, it's never a happy ending. So it's always loss of function. So I think that we need to look at um, and prioritize therapeutics that have dual purpose, that can treat a disease, but at the same time target um, important uh, biological processes that are implicated in aging. And what we do uh, at Ensilico and what I do uh, in general um, is looking for those dual purpose therapeutics. So I think being dual purpose, aging and disease, that's truly key for A, identifying blockbuster drugs because uh, the probability that your uh, drug is gonna work for many people at the same time is gonna be higher if you are addressing a very broad biological process. Um, and second, 
we need to figure out aging, right? Because that's that's the main killer. So uh, this year, 60 million people are going to die of mm-hmm. the, due to aging. That's more than any war or any cataclysmic event or any plague. Um, and we need to figure out how to uh, increase health span and significantly delay death. Do you do you think it's possible uh, to delay death? I mean, there's this. Uh, there was a science fiction book that I read, I think, forty years ago, um, where the assumption was that one day uh, some pharma industry in an alternative reality will develop a drug that basically makes death a con- conscious decision, so people don't age, people don't get sick anymore. Do you believe it's possible to come to that point in our reality somewhere in the future? So with pharmacological means, I'm talking about small molecule drugs or biologics Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, even RNA therapeutics, you won't be able to dramatically increase lifespan. So I'm talking about maybe, you know, plus minus uh, 40, 50% is probably possible if you combine a bunch of uh, therapeutics that A, intervene with your metabolism and B, um, uh, improve uh, certain repair functions uh, and maybe even um, uh, stimulate certain uh, certain biological processes that are just too expensive for the body to run all the time or where we do not have a biological program. Um, uh, so I think that significant life, uh, life, uh, life extension is possible using pharmacological means, but not dramatic. To go dramatic, you need to look past pharmacology. It's just pharmacology is the most uh, credible way to mm. uh, extend lifespan. And um, it's also something that is very sustainable. So if you are very good at discovering and delivering novel therapeutics for diseases, uh, and you are also prioritizing aging, as your primary uh, outcome measure, so the effects on, uh, on, 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 on the health span and lifespan of your patients. Um, I think that this is the area where you can achieve commercial success uh, and then fund other areas of longevity research that may give you uh, more longevity dividend compared to just pharmace- pharmaceuticals. Yeah, I think there's a lot in the lifestyle. Um, pharmaceutical is one way, lifestyle is another way. And probably with uh, Neuralink or with, with Elon Musk research or research that's going in that direction, maybe one day it's possible to upload consciousness <laughs> into into the cloud and download it to an uh, artificial intelligence or to, an, uh, to a robot. Yeah, I wouldn't bet on that. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, it's definitely a very promising area of research for other purposes, also aging and uh, mm. Alzheimer's, CNS diseases. Uh, but yeah, I could look at uh, maybe gradual replacement of neuronal tissue mm. uh, as the uh, you know way to rejuvenate the brain. But uploading, that's something that uh, we may not be able to master. I mean, creating a copy, yes, but is it going to be you? Most likely not. Why not that's create a clone then, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a big question. I have one final question left uh, when we are talking about the future. How do you envision generative AI and robotics impacting the future of healthcare and medicine? Well, I think it's already impacted in a massive way. Uh, so, and partly uh, due to our work in generative mm-hmm. chemistry and generative biology in, uh, uh, you know, 2016, 2017, uh, 2018, so seminal work. Uh, and now it has propagated. Uh, so I think that generative AI is going to transform our life uh, beyond recognition in every way, right? So we are actually moving into the new uh, era of knowledge management. So instead of retrieving knowledge uh, through search and through by browsing the different directories, we can now uh, generate uh, knowledge and uh, complete response to your queries with reasonable accuracy. This accuracy is expected to improve over time. uh, And you would be able to get uh, um, purpose-built systems for discovery. 
So just like our Panda Omics platform, but even more uh, reliant on generative uh, AI with much better user experience uh, and, uh, uh, and perhaps conversational AI. Um, and yeah, I think that we're getting into the area where generative AI will play a role in pretty much every area of drug discovery and development. Most important uh, uh, area where I see the application of generative AI is the ability to generate high quality synthetic patient data, mm. right? So currently people are just too sensitive about their healthcare data being misused for all kinds of purposes. By the way, I do not know many cases where people were hurt by having their health data accessed. They're hurt by having their financial uh, records, for example, accessed or you know, credit card information, identity information, uh, but healthcare information very rarely. Uh, there are a lot of hypotheses, but uh, insurance companies are um, uh, regulated, right, and uh, prohibited from using genomic information for discrimination. So for drug discovery, I think we should be able to use this information. Um, however, since people are so afraid of sharing their biological data, we can now use AI to generate high quality data instead of taking them from taking it from specific individual, just by like by, by asking AI to generate specific biological data sets with desired properties, uh, trained on publicly available data. That's that's a great future. That's a great future, Alex. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, and uh, on the world what the world uh, government summit. And uh, I wish you and your team all the best for the future. Uh, you're doing an amazing work. And I believe you, your team will move the healthcare industry globally forward. And enjoy the summit. Well, thank you, Christian. I again apologize uh, to you and uh, your um, listeners uh, and people who watch this uh, for the background noise and also for the kind of presentation from the field. <laughs> um, I just couldn't change it and I couldn't uh, escape. So uh, thank you for bearing with me. It's a nice, it gives a nice flavor to, to the episode. I like it. I like it. Thank you very much, Alex, and have a great day. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye. Thanks for joining me on this journey to discover the groundbreaking potential of artificial intelligence in drug discovery and anti-aging research. If this episode has blown your mind and opened your eyes to the incredible power of generative AI, then smash that like button and hit subscribe to never miss out on future episodes. Together we can spread the word and inspire a revolution in the pharmaceutical industry that will change the world as we know it. So don't be shy, leave a comment and share this video with everyone you know to help us reach more people and make a real difference. Thanks for being a part of the movement towards a brighter, healthier and longer future. Enjoy your day.